so uh, today's uh, topic is the surgical technique of letargy surgery the letargy procedure so we have talked about this procedure a multiple number of times i think uh, we have multiple videos uh, talks where we have already talked about what we do what are the indications of this surgery and what are the various variants uh, it's already in the app we have discussed as a part of various theory questions also and as a separate topic also so just to revise letargy procedure is a very well known and a well accepted procedure done for patients with shoulder instability where you have a significant glenoid bone loss so again uh, shoulder instability traumatic anterior shoulder instability with significant glenoid bone loss that is the right indication the uh, actual what you say is absolute indication for this procedure that significant what is significant glenoid bone loss has varied according to the time we are operating in uh, according to the surgeon or the author who has described it but the classically accepted uh, definition of significant glenoid bone loss was more than 20% surface area area of glenoid or more than 25% glenoid bone width loss that is described as significant recent articles have gone on to describe significant glenoid bone loss as as low as even 15% so but your uh, you should be clear that uh, whatever the significant glenoid bone loss is if there is significant glenoid bone loss uh, we will do a letargy procedure the other indications or we say relative indications of this procedure are a traumatic anterior shoulder instability in contact sports athletes traumatic anterior uh, shoulder instability in patients with failed bankards repair traumatic anterior instability in patients with hyperlaxity so these are relative indications and traumatic instability anterior instability in patients with poor capsular tissue that is sleep dislocation so these are relative indications absolute indication is anterior instability traumatic anterior instability with significant glenoid bone loss which are textbook still defined as more than 20% area of glenoid or 25% of glenoid width so this is a video by one of my teachers uh, g walsh so one of the pioneers uh, who has taught lots of surgeons this procedure so this is a variant so we have different variants how to do uh, letargy we have open letargy we have arthro letargy uh, popularized by lefost open letargy also has two variants walsh variant the video which will be show i uh, which i'll be showing just now and we have the congruent art letargy which was described uh, by the south uh, uh the south african uh, group uh, jody bear group okay so just uh, going on i'll just play this video it's a 15 minutes video and i'll along with the video i'll uh, give uh, my commentary what all is going on so i'll just start the video so this is again again grateful to g walsh for this video uh these this is G. Walsh, Letargy and Pat Pate, the Letargy, who originally described the surgery uh, by Dr. G. Walsh. So, uh, Walsh always uh, does his primary x-rays and uh, CT. This is a CT arthrogram actually, but we usually follow MRI and do a CT to calculate the glenoid bone loss. So, this is a beach chair position always done in a beach chair position always put a pad interscapular pad uh, why do we put the interscapular pad it because it just protracts your scapula a bit so you'll just be showing in his 
next video protects the scapular bit it's much easy becomes much easier to do your surgery so you do a coraco axillary incision it's about a four to five centimeter incision don't go exactly delto pectoral in the incision would go from the coracoid along towards the anti uh, towards the axillary fold so uh, remove the subcutaneous tissue uh, dissect in the same plane as your incision and then what you are looking for is the delto pectoral interval which is marked by your cephalic vein so cephalic vein would just become uh, apparent here so this is the delto pectoral interval and you uh, directly here you see your cephalic vein so it's not very superficial there may be some uh, usually some fibers of either your deltoid or pectoralis may overlap your uh, uh, cephalic vein but usually it is in the interval between the delto uh, deltoid and pectoralis so usually you take the uh, ceph i'll just pause it so usually what you do is take the uh, cephalic vein along with the deltoid laterally because a lots of tributaries from deltoid contribute or uh, come to the cephalic vein so if you take it medially along with the pectoralis you'll have to uh, you have to cauterize a lot of these perfor uh, not perforated but uh, uh, tributaries coming from the deltoid so it's better to take it laterally along with the deltoid as you take it laterally and uh, externally rotate the arm a little bit you should be able to see the pect uh, the conjoint tendon arising from the coracoid uh, so this is just i'm just uh, walsh is just putting his woman above the coracoid this is your conjoint tendon seen beautifully this would be your coraco acromial ligament cal this ligament this white structure so the conjoint tendon what do you do is so i'll just pause it uh, again so the conjoint tendon this is your tendon next to the tendon would be the muscle of the conjoint tendon so you what do you do is dissect lateral to this muscle you don't dissect lateral to the conjoint tendon you dissect lateral to the muscle of the conjoint tendon so you do dissection of lateral to the conjoint tendon and you see the pec, uh, the coracoacromial ligament right there so you remove cut the coracoacromial ligament so uh, you take uh, remove the uh, cut the uh, conjoint tendon with uh, sorry you cut the coracoacromial ligament with a part of coracoacromial ligament still attached so this part of coracoacromial ligament is still attached to the coracoid so this will help us to do facilitate a later closure of the conjoint of the capsule again you go more medially now you want to isolate if you want to find the interval between the conjoint tendon and your pec minor so usually here you can see on the medial side you will be able to see if you remove the so soft tissue uh, so the superficial soft tissue you usually find a cleavage uh, of fat which separates your conjoint tendon which is going straight down so conjoint tendon going straight down and pec minor going medially so you can find usually a cleavage of fat there so you dissect in that fat and remove that pec minor so this is the pec minor we are removing from the uh, coracoid process so you have to remember what all ligaments are attached and what all muscles are attached to the coracoid process so coracoid process has three muscles that is the two muscles of conjoint tendon that is coracobricalis and short head of biceps and you have the pec minor three ligaments attached are coracoacromial coracohumeral and the coracoclavicular ligaments so three ligaments three muscles you should always remember remember when you are uh, dissecting the pec minor of the conjoint uh, of the coracoid process your brachial plexus just goes below your pec minor so it's better this is a master doing the surgery so he knows to what depth you or he can go but it's better if you can put your finger your hand or blunt instrument just below this pec minor so that you don't damage your brachial plexus while doing this surgery Okay, so this is the pec minor being isolated. 
uh, by being removed from the coracoid. Now, so the coracoid has been devoid or cut off pec minor uh, medially and laterally the coracocromial ligament. So here we use a saw. If you have a right angle saw, this is better. Or you can saw, saw any other saw to cut the coracoid as near its base as possible. So you go as proximally as possible uh, and always cut from top to bottom and from medial to lateral. Okay, so here Walsh is using his light angle saw to cut the coracoid at, at its base from in, and it's cutting in the direction from med, supromedially to infrolaterally. 